Hello and welcome to the North America Gaelic Football Podcast, the home of Gaelic football here in North America. I am your host, Gareth McAlitton, along with our co-host, the one and only Connor Green. Uh, before we get started, I want to thank our sponsors, Mesita, who are the official sponsor of the USGS since 2017. For anybody that doesn't know Mesita, they are one of Ireland's leading manufacturers of sports kits and teamwear. They are a 100% Irish-owned family business who are passionate and dedicated in supplying their customers with quality gear and top-class service. If your club is interested in getting involved uh, with Mercedes Teamwork, please feel free to re reach out to us. We're happy to get you involved with the right people. So without further ado, a man that needs no introduction, the president of the USGAA, Bernie Connickton. Bernie, what's the crack with you? How's everything going? Good night, guys. Connor, how are you? That's too bad, no? Okay, go fine. Well, Connor has a bunch of questions, and so do I. Uh, so, Connor, why don't I let you kick off the kick off the show with some questions, and yeah. uh, let's get ready to rock and roll. Uh, Bernie, just if you could tell us a bit about yourself, where you're from back home, a bit about your move to the US, and who your club is in Boston. Sure. Before I get going, guys, I want to congratulate both you on the official start of your podcast. Um, I want to wish you the best of luck on it, and uh, it's good. Good publicity for everybody involved and uh, also to have a uh, Mesita on board. It's great to have our main sponsor supporting you. And as I said, any help you can give them, we appreciate it. But uh, yes, I am from uh, Williamstown in County Galway. It's a small little village in the northeast Galway. It's a football club intermediate. And I came here in January 87, a few years ago. Came for one year, still here. <laughs> But um, I got involved with the Shannon Blues uh, in Boston when I got here and uh, played a bit of football for them for a few years. Can we, can we, can we just cut that then if you said you were with the Shannon Blues? You know, I know it was a former <laughs> Max fan, you know, but hey, listen, we'll not hold it against you today, Bernie, you know, so. <laughs> That's all right. Rivalry is good. Hey, rivalry is great. It's good, great. To, see, it's good to, see it's, it's good to see both clubs still in existence. Yeah. Oh, it's phenomenal. I mean, I remember when I first came here in 2011, you know, the Shannon Blues and Mac and Espy's rivalry was was phenomenal. You know, two two yeah. elite clubs going at it every year. You know, it's uh, no, it's been great. Uh, great to see that both clubs and, uh, are still going very strong. Uh, go ahead not on. to uh, not to compliment the Blues. No, it's usually the last thing I'd want to do. Uh, but I played in, I played a bit for Cork there a few years ago, and Jesus, I don't think I'll ever forget playing against the Blues. It was fucking tough going. <laughs> so, and uh, so just another question for yourself, Bernie. If you were to explain Gaelic football to someone on the streets of Boston, how would you explain it to them? Uh, uh, Gaelic football, I would say anybody that plays basketball definitely could take on football. Uh, you know, it's a good mix. You know, with basketball with. The hands basically, and anybody then that plays a bit of rugby, you know, they could take it on. It's it's a mix, you know, soccer, rugby, and basketball. You know, uh, a lot a lot of girls seem to pick it up quicker than than guys because, uh, well, especially the, you know when the guys made uh, uh, drills to do in in ladies football, so they they do pick it up quicker and maybe if they played a bit of volleyball or played basketball, it seems to come quicker, but um, that'd be it. Rugby or rugby or soccer. We, we've definitely seen the element of volleyball come in now lately with, you know, the palming almost down into the net. Uh, one thing I like to add on to the basketball, uh, it's more like street basketball, you know, mm -hmm. regular basketball, you throw a couple of hits in there, they call a few fouls, like, you know, street basketball, you know, you can get, in, you're not getting any, any files. So that's kind of my whole thing with it. It's like a mixture of soccer, rugby, and street basketball. Uh, and if it was a Mac and and Blues game, it might be a little boxing in there. But that's that's all right, you know? <laughs> Once there's a good referee in the middle, it'll be fine. Exactly. exactly. All, all the best elements of every sport, you could argue now. So. I mean, so we can almost move on to, like, what kind of got you into the, the USGA board? I know... I, I, you were pretty involved with the the Northeast board for before you got onto the USGA board, correct? Yes, I um, basically I played football for a few years with the Blues, and then uh, we started the youth back up again in Boston. It was sort of gone straight there for a few number of years, and probably in '98, 
probably started back up again. I got involved with basically my son was coming to that age and, uh, you know, we got it up and going. And the, the great Donny Keneally, Lord Mercy and Donny was uh, the youth officer at the time. And Donny asked me, would I uh, get on? He, he was the youth officer on the board. So he asked me, would uh, I get on the board to replace him because he was heavily involved with the Christophers. So uh, I got to blame Donny Keneally for, 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 for me getting involved in the board. But basically, I, I, yes, the, the first year, probably around 2000, went on the board as a youth officer. And John McDevitt was a chair at the time, and he got elected to uh, North America at, in my first year. And he asked me would I step up and take vice chair or chair. So I took vice chair, and Jim Grealish took chair, and the rest is history. We, I did the two years vice chair, and did the six years then uh, chair in Boston, and then took a year or two off, and then I joined the USGA, was which was North America at the time. So uh, this is my 10th year now on the USGS, my, my final year. It's, it's a five-year term. So I did five vice and in my fifth this year. Now, quick question, Bernie. So uh, you just mentioned there the five-year term on the USGA, but is that the same with the divisions? Uh, is there like a time cap for each division for somebody being chair? Yes, it's basically across, it's basically across for clubs and divisions and counties. But look at, we all know how hard it is to get volunteers. So club-wise people you know they they stay there as long as they can but it, it is basically a five-year rule for any position that you can go away for five and then you can go back to it again but i i, I really think it, it was a, a great rule to bring in it's not in it, it came in in my final year in boston because i ended up doing six in boston but um i think it's good because uh people can be there for too long and it gets old it, it's good to get new blood in there and new positions because uh people get tired of the same people selling the same thing all the time you know or even changing things it gets old so it, I, I really feel it was a, it was a great idea to bring in the the term limit in, in in the GA so just to piggyback off that so now you're you move from the northeast division you were on that board for a long time and now now you're on the USGA board and you've been on that for a while so as the USGA president you know what is what is your kind of day-to-day roles like maybe not day-to-day you know, because obviously it is a volunteer position, but, you know, what is the day-to-day responsibilities of the president of the USGA? And, you know, how do you balance that with, you know, your everyday life? Because you're obviously working away as well. So <laughs> when you, I know it's a voluntary job, but when you take uh, and look at take chair or anything, any position in the USGA or, or your division, it's basically that's your full-time job. Then your full-time job becomes your part-time job. Yeah. But uh, basically, you know, you try to do as much as you can at all possible. Look, there's a lot of people asking a lot of questions all the time. We have, a, look, we have 160, over 160 clubs in the USGA right now. It's grown unbelievably over the last number of years. We're basically around five or six new clubs every year. And even through COVID, we increased our clubs. I think we have something like 30 new clubs in the last five years. So there's an awful lot of work dealing with those new clubs. I know you're dealing with day-to-day with all divisions, but look at, we have 10, 10 divisions in the USGA, and look at, they're the boots on the ground. We we look out to the, for them to do the basically work. Everything goes through the division in each of the divisions. The clubs go through the division, and then the, the divisions have any issues or problems that come to us. But, um, yeah, look at, it, it, it is easier with email and apps, and look at, we learned an awful lot from COVID, because look at, before that, we'd be on phone calls and doing this with Microsoft Teams. Now, it's great. You know, you, you can, like, like we're just here right now, you know, it's, it's a lot easier because we don't we don't meet that many times during the year. We try to meet more often now than we did in the past, but it's still tough. But there is an awful lot of work. And look, at we're, we're in the process of hiring a full-time administrator. So that'll take a lot of pressure off everybody and it'll help out the new clubs. Definitely. Definitely. And actually, you brought up a good point there. Uh, you know, definitely challenging times 2020. We uh, we definitely seen the effect of it over here. You know, we used to get a lot of the lads over for the summer, but for two years or almost we didn't have anybody. Right. So, you know, through during those couple of years, what do you think was the biggest challenges you guys faced? We, well, the, 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 there was a huge challenge in 2020 because we we came back from Congress that year and we had great ideas, you know, basically they're sort of come to fruition now, but it, it, with, the two, with the two years we're missing COVID, it was tough, but, you know, yes, the 2020, 
we had a lot of planning on and we had flights booked and we had hotels booked for different meetings and stuff. It didn't happen, you know, and you never get those funds back again. But, you know, we, we got through 2020. I know we weren't allowed to play here and in, in, in most states we weren't. But 2021, we got back on the fields again. I, I understand we didn't have any sanctioned players or into, or into, uh, uh, into transfer uh, players, you know, into, into county transfers coming out earlier. And uh, basically, we got through it because every club got all these American kids to play for them. And look, we, we still ran the championships and ran tournaments around the country and I, the playoffs were in Boston that year at the end. It was a lot of pushing and, and, you know, to get, get clubs out there, get them back on the road again. And uh, it was a great finals in Boston. And, you know, for, you know, more than, you know, your own old club, McInnesby, it's like they won a, a need, an intermediate county final that year with no sanction. Like that's all been in their history. You know, it's huge. Like, you know, you say you win a county final and everybody says, oh, you rely on the, the summer players. Well, not really, because um, all these American kids got to, play, got to play at a higher level. And it just shows today where they're at now. You know, and Galway Holland, the same thing. You know, they won a county final with probably eight or ten American kids. One of them was captain. And, you know, the same with the, with the, with the juniors. And, you know, it, it, it was. It, it, it was. And Donegal won a senior football the same year, that, that year, too. County final with uh, no sanctions. So, things things did move on and people learned a lot from it. And as far as us with the USGA, we got more tournaments. We, we have more tournaments now than we ever had before since COVID. Uh, and later in the year, we're getting tournaments now where we, you know, usually Labor Day weekend, that was the finish. That used to be the old North American finals or uh, play the playoffs. And basically, when that was over, that was it for the year. Everybody just wrapped it up. But now we have tournaments going right through November. So, um, you know, more than the, the local one here that's uh, started up at Greg Hawes. It's great to see there should be more of those because uh, with the weather in September and October, yeah, we, we we definitely should have more, but some divisions are better, you know, doing it because look at a lot of divisions can't have uh, playoffs or divisional competitions. They're so spread out, so they do the best they can because we're sort of spoiled here in the northeast, guys. As you know, we don't have too far to go to go to Canton. I, I know you do now, but uh, I remember a, a couple of years ago I went to a tournament in Nashville, and uh, you know, listening to the guys uh, on the Saturday morning, it was the hottest weekend I think we had in, uh, ever in the, in the country. Uh, it was only a few years back. And, uh, you know, listening to those guys in the morning, they're after driving 12 hours. They finished work at 5 o'clock on Friday evening. They drove 12 hours to get to Nashville to play a tournament all day Saturday and party Saturday night and back in the cars and 12 hour drive back again. Like, I vote, I vote a motion for uh, a tournament every quarter in Nashville. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we just we just hire we just brought on a new club uh, as we call them uh, on board them. We just brought on a new club from Mexico, so that's be, that'd be a nice place to go to for a convention. Yeah. Or, uh, they're uh, they're on this shirt somewhere. Uh, if, uh, sure they do you see all the clubs? Yeah, I think that we we put them on it there. Actually, got... just just while we're talking about that, there, you know, actually, Mesita done a really nice job with that shirt. You know, actually, uh, if you can zoom in a little, Connor, you want to stand up there, give us a wee model. You'll have all the USGA clubs listed on that. And uh, stay tuned for that because we will actually have more information about where you can actually get these shirts. Uh, and we will be raffling off one of these shirts as well uh, for one of our viewers. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but just to back what you were saying there, Bernie, I think, uh, you know, through COVID, it really talked about, uh, you know, the real stability in the home base lads, you know, not just here in the Northeast, but everywhere, you know, I, we, me and Connor were both at that finals in Boston and normally, yeah, you get that, you know, a lot of people, but it was still well, it was the people flew in, you know, people were actually looking forward to it. I know the weather and the Sunday didn't help. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I think we had a pretty much a Northeastern coming in, but you know, it was very well attended and it was a testament to the, the home clubs, you know, really rallying together, you know, where you would have had 10 or 11 sanctions coming in yep. uh, to help out a club. But I think it was a real testament to the clubs and, you know, really getting together through that time uh, to make sure that, you know, people were showing up to the Nationals. So it was a real you know, testament to the clubs here in the Northeast and anybody that traveled in uh, through them times. So 
fair play to use of the USGA for making sure that was still a priority to getting that back and back back on. I think uh, like like what it shows really like with all you know when you're talking about American guys playing and all this and winning winning at a high level like uh, you know it just shows it's not really just an Irish thing anymore you know especially like social media and things like that are helping big time I think I'm I'm noticing even comments from from uh, you know like I I, I comment on a TikTok video there recently a fella from young young kid from the Philippines uh, I was like oh how how can I play this sport you know. Uh, and he's he's saying he's gonna buy a ball and kick around with his friends and all this, and uh, you know you see the likes of uh, I'm sure everyone has seen it on social media as well. There in Uganda, you know they set up a team, kind of out of nowhere, really. You know it's just a bunch of yeah, just a bunch of locals, like so. Yeah, uh, well we're just we're, we're just talking about it at our convention there uh, in um in November. We're we're, we're going over sixty five percent American born players now playing our game, so we're it's it's gradually going the opposite, the other direction, which is great to see, you know. Yeah. I, I mean, I, in my opinion, that's the foundation. You know, that's you know, there's not as many. You know, I'm sure Bernie, you were aware. You know, you're you're here in the U.S. since '87. You were saying so. You know, in the early nine in the '90s and early 2000s, there was a heap of Irish lads coming over. You know, it's probably not the same as that anymore. And you know, the foundation of the clubs now is them American borns because they're the ones that's coming up through and telling their friends and getting their friends involved. You know, so the the American you know, generation that's coming through is almost like it's very important now for the growth of these, especially the senior clubs. And the talent over here with some of these players, like, you know, we have a couple of lads in our team, like they just started a year and a half ago. And just, you know, the athleticism is there. You yeah. know, it's just the getting them in and training and getting them the right coaching and the right training, you know. Uh, and, you know, thankfully the USGA has great... Um, great programs in there to making sure that coaches have uh, the tools they need to help, you know, coach new, new players. Right. Yep. Because that's the toughest part is getting coaches and referees, you know, it's already playing the game, but you know, it's not like Ireland where you can pull a couple of people and it's like, they know the game that can ref, you know, you're, it's kind of niche market here. Yeah. No, just, just uh, uh, not this weekend, next weekend uh, with a huge coaching uh, weekend, the coach tutor weekend in Chicago. 25th um i think we have something like 40 people coming in uh chicago that weekend we have two uh, we have a coaching weekend and also we have a, a, a leadership meeting that's basically bringing in all the, the head people from the divisions and uh basically to have a meeting to give us a you know give us an idea what we, what they need in divisions and what the usga can do to help them and basically um a plan for going forward because there's a lot of new ideas a lot of, a lot of good stuff coming up from the usga over the next number of years will so be exciting yeah, uh, Bernie. Just a question for you there. Uh, you mentioned something about uh, USGA might be hiring uh, a full time administrator. What, yes. Uh, what What would you think that could potentially bring to the table now, or, or what that would that? Basically, is um, well, basically, it's the Department of Foreign Affairs and Croke Park that's uh, agreed to give us uh, to to uh, basically hire somebody full time, so there'll be a full time a full paid time position. Um, it, it, it will be huge for us. It, it'll probably be, you'll hear more about it in the next couple of weeks. We, we just uh, finished up uh, doing the final spec on, on the on the job. Um, basically, you'll still have a county board, you'll still have the county secretary, the chair, the treasurer, and all those positions. But the administrator will be basically a lot more to do with development than, a, you know, dealing day to day stuff, you know, because these new clubs and, you know, the, the these divisions with, with with developing clubs, they need more help, and the county board, you know, is struggling with all the other work they have to do. That you know, they cannot, you know, in their full time jobs, they cannot be there to reach out back to them and it's getting phone calls. And so, uh, this person will take huge pressure off and uh, basically uh, help out the, the development committees in, in each of the, the divisions. Uh, it will go out to advertisement probably in the next month to six weeks. And there'll be an interview process, and then there'll be somebody hired. Basically, hopefully, we'll have it, we'll have it done before the summer. Connor, was that question uh, sort of you putting your name in there? Is that what it was? Is like, oh, uh, geez, yeah, I, not, maybe. maybe a little hand coming up there is like, oh, <laughs> yeah, throw yeah, myself yeah. into the mix. <laughs> It'll be open for it's basically when, when it's a government job like that in Crow Park, it's open to the world, they put it out there to everybody, and they, they take then they give it, I leave it open for about two weeks, and then they. They basically start doing the interviews. Well, there'll be a lot of people knocked off, maybe right off the bat, because look, you have to be able to get it. If, if you're not living in America, you have to be able to get a visa. 
and be able to work in the states and all that stuff. So there's a lot, there's a lot to, to be done before it gets there. But we hope to have a person in place before the summer. So, you, uh, Bernie, just to touch base as well. You were just recently in Ireland uh, as part of the USGA going into the convention. How was that? Uh, how was that experience? I see uh, Johnny Oak, good arm man, yep. uh, elected as a new uh, president of the GAA. Uh, big shout out to Johnny. Uh, you know, yep. he does great yep. things up there in our man, St. Paul's, one of the high schools. Um, but yeah, uh, how, how was that meeting and what did you take from that that you can meet? Yes, look at, um, we, we do have a, we, we have a lot of meetings with Crow Park. Look at, I could be. You know, just last Friday, you know, I, I had a meeting usually during the day because with the five hour difference, uh, we do have a lot of meetings. But in the last number of years, we have a, a, a World GA Council. Basically, all the overseas units have a committee and the four provincial chairs are on that, that committee. And plus uh, the president or uh, the CEO, the Camogie and CEO of Ladies Football is on that committee. And we have a world chair who is Niall Erskine from um, Donegal. And then... Um, the secretary of that is, is Charlie Harrison from uh, Sligo. I don't, if you remember him, he did play football with Sligo. He works in Crow Park now. He's basically an administrator and he works with overseas units as well as other positions there also. But um, that's that committee is set up that, you know, we have a vice at, at the head table and also we have um, the World GA chair is a centre council delegate. So that's huge, you know, to have a voice there. Um we do have a lot of meetings over the weekend. I know the uh, Congress basically goes on just Friday night and Saturday, but there's workshops goes on during the day and Friday. But we, we, we start at Thursday morning around 10 o'clock, and we go right through Thursday and Friday, and then Congress on Saturday. So we have an awful lot of meetings with World GEA, basically, with the overseas units, because everybody, you know, we have them during the year, but it's great to get face-to-face. -face. And, uh, you know, we, we have our AGM, basically, at that. And... Um, you know, we, we go through everything that we need. We do workshops, you know, we get some support from uh, the different offices in Crow Park, you know, on that. And um, basically then, on you know, we, we, we did meet with the three uh, clients who was running for uh, Pat Tehan, Niall Erskine and Jarrett who was running for president. We, we met those three on the Thursday, you know, to tell them what, the, what the, we're going to do for USGA. You know, basically... We have sort of talked over and back with them over the last six months. I know, so look at it. Sure, uh, there's an election on the Friday night, but basically on, on the Friday we we have a lot of meetings with uh, with, with ladies football, Kamogi, Munster, who was our twin partner. Munster does a power work with us. Like we, uh, they they basically deal with any coaching that we've done or any development. So basically, uh, that'd be it on Friday, and then you know the election was on Friday night, and then the motions on Saturday. But you meet you, you get to meet all the the, the heads basically of the of the different provincials and uh, provinces and uh, then you know you're meeting the president you're meeting the the different guys you know that that you're, you know when you when you call them up you have a face to, you have a face to, to remember of you know when, what, what you're looking for but uh, it, it's good to meet these people because um, you know Congress is one thing with motions and changing rules but a lot of them don't affect us. And you know, so you, you, the meetings on the Thursday and Friday, and the, the few beers in the bar, and have a chat with the boys is probably you get more out of that sometimes than uh, you know. We meet the GPA also, and we meet you know whoever else you know our sponsors. We met Mesita, you know whoever we have to meet on, on those three days. You know it's fairly busy, but it, it's great to meet the uh, the hierarchy of the GA. You know, and you know when we we're looking for anything, you know they, they're always there. You know to help us. We have we have a good year in Crow Park, so it's good. You know, yeah. and it's great to see uh, an overseas uh, president right now. He's one year left, Larry McCarthy from New York. So it's good to see Larry being there at the head table. Did you see the story just there today, Bernie? Um, the five hundred thousand they're giving to to New York is it? Yeah, that that would become uh, uh, that's DFA. That's from the D Department of Foreign Affairs. That's government funding. And, and yeah, look, yeah. they're entitled to it because oh, um, you know, with yeah. uh, we, we do get a lot of funding ourselves. From the Department of Foreign Affairs, like you know, to uh, for coaching and uh, basically our GDAs are paid by through that, and uh, we have Global Games grants that goes out to basically six divisions. We we have we have GDAs in four divisions. We have one in Boston, one in the Northeast, uh, one in Philly. There's one in uh, the Western Division, and there's one in uh, the Central Division. And then the other six divisions, uh, 
you know, we have to most with, with um, as much as we can with stuff. But uh, basically, there's grants there for those six divisions that are called the Global Games Development Grants. And they're huge grants, and that comes from the Department of Foreign Affairs, and that comes out at the end of the year, and basically right now, the startup. So. The, uh, and, and that's basically for projects and uh, running tournaments and wherever it goes on. So, a uh, big year ahead. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a couple of big names coming out again uh, this summer. Uh, any spoilers? No. Um, basically, uh, we don't sort of get into much in that. You know, I, I see there's a lot of in the county transfers coming out right now, but that's usual, and it's this time of the year. But, you know, I'm sure the clubs have done their homework. But, we, you know, the USGA is basically looks at us that uh, we, we're more pushing for the American-born players. You know, it's great to see the summer players coming. Uh, we need everybody. You know, they, they definitely put seats, in, they put um, bums in the seats in, 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 in all the big cities. But, um, you know, there was an awful lot out last year. But basically, that was because um, nobody had come for a couple of years with COVID. So there's a big spring of people, uh, students coming. But it, it is great. It, it, they add a lot to it. You know, they add a lot to the, the local town and, you know, the... People likes to see them, but um, no, um, the only thing that's coming up right now, in, in, so in, close to our season, would be the game in uh, New York, which leads them and uh, New York. But other than that, no, we wouldn't be too much into it. Yeah, myself and Connor will be definitely up at that one. Uh, maybe getting talking to a few people, doing a few interviews, and all that good stuff, you know. But I think the next big one after that would be Denver, right? Uh, how uh, how excited are you for Denver? Because that's a uh, that'll be a fun that'll be a fun location. Um, yes, they had they they had the playoffs maybe probably nineteen years ago probably uh, since they had them. Um, it was in um, Boulder that time. It's in a different uh, town this time. It's not too far from Boulder, but um, yes, yeah, beautiful. It's the same set setting again. Uh, you know the Rocky Mountains there in the background. Beautiful fields. Uh, they're well on their way. It'll be a looking to be a brilliant playoffs. No doubt about it. We have an awful. We have, but that's the interest right now, even from Canada, uh, you know, it's going to be tough because look at, we have so many teams ourselves now that we've grown and everybody wants to go to the playoffs, which is great, you know. So, yeah. uh, Den Denver, you know, Denver, we got to get used to the attitude. It's going to be tough. And we were there yeah. ourselves. Yeah. I was just, I was just going to say, are, are there going to be balls flying over the bear now, like you see in the NFL there? Um, with the high yeah, attitude I, and I all think, that. I think the pressure will be on, on the players because they won't be used to that. Uh, Altitude and um, I you, might you, uh, I might be going back standing in goals there. I reckon I might pull a kick out over there or something. The forty five will become the sixty five. <laughs> <laughs> but it definitely, it definitely, it'll be a great playoffs because it's a new city and everybody likes to go to a new city. They get tired of the the San Fran's and the Chicago's and the Boston's all the time. So when it's in a new city and it's great, you know that uh, every uh, uh, other. And if, and years, going to you're saying uh, you're saying it's been 19 years since they hosted it. How how does yes. that work now with the with the scheduling of that? How did they uh, get it? Or like you, you know you, you you know you see Boston getting it there every you know every six five, years six seven, six years is it? So with Chicago and so with San Francisco and so with Philly, and then all the the other six would get it in between those. So it'd be every six years basically one. One of the other ones, one of the smaller divisions. So basically, the last one that hosted was um, Mid Atlantic. It was in uh, Virginia, there, if you Washington, there a few years ago. Yeah. And then the one before that was in Seattle. But uh, yes, it'll be in. Uh, it's in Denver. Um, Denver this year, and then it's going to be in San Francisco in twenty four, and then it'll probably be going to the Heartland or the Southeast Division. It's funny you say that, oh, Denver. Uh, one of our upcoming episodes with Mesita, uh, we'll have we'll have hopefully some previews of the the shirt that's going to be uh, sold at the at uh, at the finals. Mm -hmm. uh, so stay stay tuned for that one. Uh, but yeah, no, that's going to be a fantastic weekend. I know a lot of people is definitely going to be looking forward to that. Mm -hmm. You know, I think one question I think a lot of people would probably want to know. So like the Northeast is very competitive. That's, that's what we're used to here, right? Mm -hmm. So you have very competitive divisions here where you have to win your division to get to finals. Is that the same in every division or does that differ per region? No, it differs. We would say 
basically there be five or six divisions that basically run the uh, competition right through the summer and, and divisional co- finals. Uh, some doing a small way, but the likes of some divisions they're they're spread out too much to be impossible. You know, like the southwest division is half the country. You know, they would they'd be impossible. Like Denver's even Denver, it's way off, so far away, a few hours flight from you know and from everybody else. So it's just that um, they won't be able to do it. Southeast Southeast does it in a small way. Mid Atlantic does it. So, Midwest have started doing it in the last number of years. So definitely, uh, it, 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 we, we try to do it, but it, it just doesn't work out all the time. But they find they figure a way how to uh, send their teams. You know, they agree in it. So. Yeah, it's funny. I was actually just talking to uh, John Young, who's actually going to be our next episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, so stay tuned for that one. He is the president of uh, the Midwest Division. Yes, yes. yeah. Midwest, which, uh, you know, and that's one thing they run into. You know, they might have, you know, they have teams from, you know, Albany, New York to mm-hmm. right down to Cleveland, Cleveland right? Detroit, so it's hard yeah. to get them games in. Like, that's a yeah, long... Yeah. You know, so they what they do, I believe, is they split it up in the two, a north and a south. Uh, but I can't imagine in the southwest, you know, with if that's you know far down as San Diego, I believe, as uh, Satanza, yeah. right? Yeah, and then they go all the way up to Seattle, right? So, uh, that's a that's a big division, <laughs> yeah. They, they, they're so spread out, you know, it, it is tough, you know, they, that you know, Texas basically does their thing down there on their own, you know, it's so it's like Texas alone is so vast. You know, so yeah. it, it, it does, you know, but they get it done and look at they, they look forward to the, the finals every year. So, you know, we do the best we can to get in as many teams as we can. So look at your last year it was the largest ever in um Chicago with over a hundred games over the three days. Like Saturday morning, I think the first game started before seven o'clock. We were out there on the field, so still dark, trying to do a registration. <laughs> it's a good point. Uh, you know, we were myself and Connor were actually out at uh, Midway Chicago and it was I I mean it was phenomenal. Uh you know since I've since I've been here, when did I come here? Twenty eleven. Um, you know, the growth in the USGA has been phenomenal. And you took over so this is your fifth year now, right? Yeah, so, I, I did five before that as vice chair. I, I went in there on thirteen. Yeah. So from where you started in twenty thirteen, uh, you know, you probably don't know the number off the top of your head, but you know how how much have you grown since you've been in there to where you are now? Uh, oh, we probably we probably have over fifty clubs since then, definitely over fifty. You know because uh, hurling has grown unbelievably over the last number of years. It's unbelievable. Like you know these guys take like these uh, as I said these guys have no problem driving ten or twelve hours to play a game of hurling. You know they 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 just love hurling and uh, I think maybe in Boston that year twenty twenty one with more hurling games than football. So the Hurling lads are getting to getting their way now. They're happy to see uh, Hurling. You know, and it's great to see it. Yeah, you know, I think I think some of these fellas like like we were talking about, like your men play hurling. Um, you know, they've they've done a good job of promoting it. Like, in, uh, it, you know, when you think of in ter- in terms of the ease of getting a team off the ground and all that, I think football is much. There's there's no comparison. You've a, you've a number of things going your way. Like it's just an easier kind of a skill to pick up. Yeah. More, more, you know, you'd, you'd hurling. You'd almost want to have played, played lacrosse or hockey or something like that to have yeah. too much of a of hope of picking it, it up. We see it with uh, a lot of the clubs now in the states, uh, in the USGA, where um, a lot of guys take up hurling at later years. Yeah. You'll see a lot of guys in their fifties playing hurling. Uh, you would yeah. see that in Ireland, but uh, yeah. definitely uh, here, uh, you see guys starting playing hurling here in thirty and thirty something, where guys would be giving it up at home. So, it's funny. I, I mean, yeah. I never, I never played hurling in my life until I moved to Worcester, and it's, I mean, it's phenomenal. It's great, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, but it, 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 to get the point, Connor's point, it's very hard. You know, it's a, it's, it's almost like a difficult skill to pick up because yeah. you know if you're in a team there where you're, you know, lads has been playing a couple of years, and you're in there and you're struggling to pick the ball, it's very frustrating. Like you know, where football. Yeah. You know, it's a lot. You can get away with the mistakes a little easier, you know, because it even needs- just a few little things like, like, like I always say, the, the field matters an awful lot in hurling. Like, you know, if you're playing on an awful kind of a bumpy ground or turf or something like that, it's, it's, it changes the game. You know, football is kind of the same game, no matter what surface. You know, you, 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 you can't really complain too much about a field like or anything like that. 
um, you know, equipment, so all that, you know, you need, you need a hurley and a helmet to play hurling, uh, football, you, all, you, all, you need a pair of boots, you're a gun, you're a way to go, you know. We do have to give a small bit more funding to the hurling clubs because they have more expense with uh, the equipment, so, you know, the, the hurling boys does a good job on that, looking for funds, and they reach out to us. It's funny, we've, uh, uh, myself and Connor have been going back and forth with this new club in uh, North Carolina, the Red Wolves. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, they're putting out harsh, funny stuff, like, you know, and it's great marketing, like, and it's great fun. Uh, and it's, it's great, you know, we're in a time now where social media can expand so much. Yeah. Uh, look, Bob's Burgers, I've, I don't know if you ever heard of that show. Uh, they yeah, just yeah. had a Tipperary jersey and a hurling on one of those clips. So, you know, it's definitely getting out there. Now, Hurling Hurling's definitely a growing. Uh, mm-hmm. We, I mean, ourselves, we added a second team in Worcester, you know, since since COVID. We had one Hurling team and now we have a football team, two Hurling teams. Oh, We've got the New England like Fenians. You know, so yeah, yeah. well, there was a reason you got club of the year in twenty twenty one. Yeah, you know, you deserve great credit for you know the, the way you're growing the club. You know, th- that's what it's all about. You know, to get uh, get all the go- the the codes in there. Uh, just kind of on like the current status uh, of the USGA. You know, let's let's talk about the women's football. Yep. Uh, you know, that's really, you know, we, we were actually, when we were at Nationals there in Chicago, the, the women's football was very, very well attended. You know, what's, you know, how have you seen that grow in the last few years? And, you know, and could there be more done to kind of help the growth there? Uh, yeah, look, at the ladies football has grown. Look, you can see it in Ireland. The standard is unbelievable. And it's the same here. And you can see it over the years here with Char- Charlotte, all-American team. And they are as good as any senior team. They've won a couple of senior North Americans on their own, like without a, any Irish player whatsoever. But a lot of these girls are soccer players and basketball players, and it, they just pick it up so quick. But, uh, you know, there's no great credit. Uh, the standard has gone. But, yes, it has grown. Uh, COVID did hurt them a lot. I don't know why it did, but it seemed to hurt the ladies' clubs more than hurt the men to get back again at it. But you look at the, the – we, we have in the last number of year, couple of years, we have uh, – Set out these uh, four code committees, uh, basically one for ladies football, camogie, hurling, and men's football, and sort of they we we give them budgets. You know, we just passed their budget there earlier on the year. It's probably the largest budget we ever approved. But uh, they do a lot of stuff. You know, between uh, tournaments and workshops and different stuff through the year. You know, the and then like. They do come in uh, as very strong to the to the playoffs. And uh, look at sure in, uh, I think it's um, Easter weekend. It's probably three or four week in four three or four weeks time. The ladies all stars are in uh, Texas, so that'll be a huge weekend uh, for ladies football. Uh, there's a lot of ladies clubs down in the southwest. Uh, it, it's tough. No, it is Easter weekend, and it's harder to get people to travel on on being a Easter. But uh, they definitely. Uh, Ladies is growing. You can just see it in even in uh, here in the Northeast this year. There's three new ladies clubs starting in Boston. This, not clubs, teams. Three new, new uh, ladies teams in Boston. Maybe one club and two teams. Uh, I think Providence is starting a new ladies team. Uh, Hartford's a new ladies team, and Brendan's will have a new club. So that that'll be a huge uh, boost here in the Northeast because uh, you know we've sort of probably been hurting up here in the Northeast for the last number of years. Uh, with just the two teams, the two clubs. So um, definitely, yeah, it's grown. And then, like, there's a lot going on with Camogie. Uh, uh, we had a huge growth the last couple of years in Camogie. You know, uh, there was a started back up here again in the Northeast. There was no Camogie team or clubs here for years. But it's great to see the, the New England Fenians there starting up. And they're after going from strength to strength. First year, they won the junior North Americans. Second year, and the, uh, last year, with the, they won the intermediate. So now they're senior. But all across the, uh, the the county, there's a huge amount of um, camogie clubs getting set up, being set up at, at the moment. So, how does the USGA support youth development and encourage young people to get involved? Well, basically, the my, we have a minor uh, board uh, in, in the USGA, which is uh, basically a subcommittee of the they're elected, but they're subcommittee of the uh, the county board, and they basically deal with all youth. Um, Youth, look at youth even uh, right across the country uh, has grown unbelievably over the last 10, 15 years. And especially because of the CYC 
that's a tournament that's played every year with Canada, New York, and the USGA. It's coming up uh, this year in San Francisco. It's usually the last weekend in July. Uh, and she looked at tournaments around the country, and uh, you know, but at the, still to this day, we still don't have, and I don't think it, it'll work. I know is where adult clubs have youth clubs because they've tried that in the past and never worked. So they're, sometimes they're better off youth teams to have the youth clubs to have their own club and let the adults do their own thing. Because the youth are coming through, I know they will they will play whatever adult club they want. But uh, there, there is a lot happening on on that in the stuff. But sure, look, we 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 are setting up uh, an, a, a county team that will try to get these kids once they come through. Our biggest problem is, you know, more than in Ireland, once these kids hit eighteen years of age and they go to college, we don't see a lot of them again. So hopefully we can set up a county team now that this there will be something to for them to drive into. Yeah. yeah. Let's talk a little bit more about that, if you can. Um, yeah. Um, well, basically, what we have, look, at this was one of the things we, we touched with back in 2020, before COVID, that we were t- thinking about starting a county team, basically, it get involved in the Junior All-Ireland. And, uh, you know, it, it was just talk at the time, but then COVID hit, so we had to sort of park it for a while because um, it was we had to concentrate on getting clubs and teams back out on the field again. But we sort of touched base in the last six months to a year. We said, look, we'll, we'll, we'll put it back out to the uh, divisions again, you know, to get involved in the Junior All-Ireland. Uh, New York is involved in that too in Britain. And I think he won it last year. Uh, basically, it's, it's played in July. So we came up with a plan and I was that, you know, we, that, that uh, basically we would try to do it American Board. Because um, there's no point bringing out Irish lads to uh, play for for the USGA, you know, especially for junior all and So it, it it will be American born. Uh, there's a committee set up to look in to see could it happen. So they came back, brought it back to the divisions, and it is going to happen. So we uh, basically for this year we will uh, in October, which is a holiday in probably the first or second week in October, we will uh, have. Uh, Basically, teams hopefully from around the the county coming into Chicago, and uh, basically there'll be a management committee there to uh, look at these players and pick a panel of thirty to forty players out of that to uh, represent the USGA in in the Junior All Ireland in twenty twenty four. So basically, you're putting your team together this year, and then get them trained up, get them ready for next year. So we just put it, we just put a committee together this week. Uh, to basically uh, get this up and going and manage it. And then hopefully in the next week or two, we'll put a uh, management and selectors in place. Yeah. This, will be huge. this will be huge for, uh, you know, because we have uh, with some great, as you said yourself there, guys, uh, with some great players here in, in the US. And it's a shame, you know, losing them. So it, it'll be something for them, you know, to look at, you know, when they're watching those lads playing in Crow Park, that they're going to get that opportunity to play in Crow Park. Yeah. My big thing is just the experience. Like, imagine, you know, you have a bunch of American-born lads. It's probably Some of them has probably never stepped foot in Ireland before in their lives. And they go there for a week and play in a, or whatever, two weeks and play in a junior All-Ireland. You know, maybe maybe they get to the final and play in Crow Park. You know, that's, I mean, what's better for a young American kid there coming through a little bit of motivation, you know, so. And that would hopefully drive in a couple more. You know, now they're, you know, now they're three buddies that they play soccer with that were sitting watching them on Facebook and Instagram playing in this stadium is what the hell is this? I want to get yeah. involved with this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's huge, like for uh, just getting fellas committed, like to be be in the GA for life almost, you know, like so, some fellas might have might be used to it. They might have traveled with teams over the years, you know. Um, you know, we have a few fellas ourselves that played like college sports and all that. Used to well, used to traveling with teams, but some fellas haven't had that experience, and I think it's great for uh, you know, it's good fun to go off with the lads. You know, go off to God knows where we you know we'd have to Chicago. It's vital that you know that it's done right from the start. You know, if it's not done right and proper from the start, it'll never work. Make sure it's well organized and put together, and these guys are are trained and coached right, and they're in shape. You know, it, it will be a small bit tougher next year that the clubs. You know, we'll have to uh, release these players some weekends to go train together. And because look, it, it is going to be a, a huge cost, but uh, we will find a way to, to, to pay for it. There'll be, no, there'll be no problem with that because look at 
we have to make sure, you know, because it, with, the, with, the, with the size of the county, we got to figure out, you know, where they're going to train, get them together as much as possible, and it's done proper. But look at our goal would be, you know, to be involved in a junior All Ireland now and strive to play in the Talchin Cup in a few years' time or whatever. And look at it, same across the road, across the board for all codes. We need to do something for hurling, ladies football, and camogie also going forward. But let's start here and see see where it goes. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think that'll be huge for the development of of, of uh, GA over here. Like you know, like that's one thing that's been lacking. I think you know, uh, if someone is is going well with their club, there's not always another. You know, you know, if you were doing really well with the club at home, you could you could you could take a shot at the county team. You know, but there's not always that stepping stone over here. So to see that coming in is uh, is great. I think definitely. So yeah, and I seen uh, I actually have a cousin over in Manchester. And uh, his club, uh, St. Brendan's over there, mm. I think they got out of, uh, you know, so it's a lot easier over there. I can see how, like, yes. you know, over in Manchester, they play, you know, an English division. And then the winner of that goes over and plays county. But I can see definitely it being a lot more tricky over here in the U.S. just with the traveling and getting a team together. Is there a plan for like maybe like a different division teams playing off? So it's like one pl- going over. Yes, it, basically what we're that, that weekend in Chicago, we'd be hoping you know some divisions don't have many football teams; they're more hurling than fo- football. So you, they can send players. You know, we're not everybody should be coming into Chicago that, that thinks that they can play for this county. So basically, yeah, there'll be some divisions that can put in a full team. So basically, what we'll be doing on the on the Saturday would be hoping we'd have at least four teams that would have two semifinals, and then as many games as possible with a final on Sunday. It would be a tournament, but you you, you get them as many games as possible, but you can find the players. You know what I mean? There there be probably some players that won't be able to show up that weekend, but we only have to do our best with them. You know what I mean? We will have that management committee put together, uh, basically for the managers and selectors. That they will be able to go around, you know, to different. There will be tournaments played this year with these with these kids, and uh, they'll be able to take a look at them, you know, to get an idea ahead. And also at the playoffs in Denver, they'll be able to look at these players, you know, play play with their clubs, and they'll have a, get a general idea before they hit Chicago at all. Now, is there any restrictions? Uh, so let's just say you have an American kid that's playing senior football. Uh, if they're playing senior football, can they? Because it'll be in the junior championship at home, right? Oh yeah, yeah. But the, but you're basically uh, it's a junior all Ireland, but your senior player from here would be play, playing that junior, definitely. Yeah, it, it, it would be different than you're playing a uh, senior at home. You know, you you still have the same thing at home. You know, you'd have senior players at home because you know they're at a lower county level. You know, like um, as long as they they're American born, that's all that would matter in this. No, that's exciting. Definitely something to look forward to. And uh, we actually, we look forward to hearing a little more about that. Uh, yeah, well, there'll be more there'll be more coming up now in the next two weeks. So, you know, keep your ear up there because definitely there'll be there'll be more to be added. You know, I, I can't say too much about it now because we only basically uh, approved it, um, the committee last night. So it's just barely out there right now. So that they kick it off from there. And then, as I said to you, hopefully in the next two weeks, we'll have more to add to that. Look, yeah. we have to get sponsors and everything and funding in place for it too. So, you know, we'll be giving a shout out to Crop Park. <laughs> well, good. Uh, I mean, that's a good point to uh, maybe move on from there. And uh, where do you see your involvement now going forward? Do you say this is your last year as president of the USGS? So, you know, going forward now, how do you, what, what role do you see yourself in? Do you see yourself <laughs> still being a uh, part of the USGA or are you kind of going to take a step no. back? Uh, look, at, uh, you never, look at, you, you probably need a break from it for a while, Anna, because, you know, you're there so long, you, 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 you need a break. You need to get away from it for a while to, uh, as I say, re-energize the batteries again. But uh, definitely I wouldn't be going away from it. I get involved someplace, I'll maybe going back to my own club. They'll probably tell me I'm missing long enough now. But, um, you know, even get involved locally with the youth or, uh, you know, in the division again. But look at there's great people in local division. I'm here right, right as there is across the country. So look at we have an unbelievable amount of great people that in the GA. And you look at the always say it, that, you know, we people walks away from committees and, and they don't come back and you lose good people. So you, they, you usually try to keep as many people as you can, you know, be, especially people that's gone through committees. 
you know, to keep them involved and try to put them in other committees or, you know, but it is tough. It does take a lot of your time because definitely I'm involved with youth right now with the CYC, that tournament. So, uh, you know, the, well, Charles, when he comes in, uh, Charles will be coming into office in February. So he'll be putting a new committee in there. So we'll just have to wait and see how that goes, you know, with, with, with how the CYC, where it is at, because uh, COVID really did hurt that tournament because um, we didn't have co we didn't have the CYC for two full years. And, you know, with youth, with their playing other sports, it did hurt it on that end. But uh, definitely I, I won't be walking away from it. I'm always there to help panels, you know, because I think we always say, like, the, G, the GA is like a drug. You get addicted to it and you can't get away from it. Oh, that's true. And yeah, you know, you brought up a point there with the, the young ones. Uh, you've been seeing over the last few years, a lot of the American teams going over to Ireland into these fellas. And, mm. you know, maybe years ago, they were just like, you know, ah, they were there for the fun. But now they're almost taking these clubs serious because they're going over there and they're winning. And, you know, they're they're playing some serious ball over there. So. Yeah, but you look at it's great. It's great to see you know the uh, the Philadelphias and the San Franciscos and uh, the, the Northeast now have uh, seen the teams over the last number of years. Look at the Northeast won their first fail last year. It's great to see it like these. They're great, unbelievable players. You know, it, it is great to see you know coming up through the youth. You know, that's what you say. You know, you like you you like to be involved in this uh, sport because you see these kids at six and seven at eight years of age when they're starting that uh, CYC and then you see them growing up through the, the youth and now they're with the adult clubs, you know, and how they've come along. It's unbelievable, you know, the coach and, and, and you know, these these guys do a great job and they're the people that does all the, that should they get the gratitude from it because they do all the, the hard work to, to get these uh, kids on the field and to make sure they continue on to get to the adult clubs. Is there resources available for these clubs? So let's, uh, I know like on the US, on like the GAA, you can, uh, I know like obviously being from Ulster, Ulster do a good job of putting up uh, like content for like trainings and stuff where people can like look yeah. into resources for training plans. And is there, is there anything with that with the US GAA for clubs? Yes, that maybe yes. If, you, if you go onto our website, there's a lot up there, but look at, any club, and I say it all the time, uh, Rob Tierney there is our GDO. Uh, Rob is in um, he's in Pittsburgh. Um, look at, Rob has a huge amount of information out there that does. But look, we work with, um, we're a twin with Munster. And look at, as they say in in, in Crow Park, if you want to look at a good twin and uh, her partnership, look at USG and Munster. Because it's absolutely unbelievable the amount of work and the amount of help that Munster gives us. You know, all across the board, like, like I was just saying that next weekend in, in Chicago, there'll be four or five people out from Munster doing those uh, doing those meetings and those coaching. And then they're going to uh, do a different, few different coaching uh, tutoring around the, around the country during the year also. But they're nonstop. And then you have a uh, referee administrator, Johnny Ryan uh, in Munster. He's a tip man. He, he's, he comes over and, and uh, trains up the referees. Like, it's nonstop. Like, when we... We, we meet with Munster all the time. They're, they're a huge, huge asset to us. But there's a ton of information up there, and they're always, even clubs or divisions, anybody out there looking for information, just go through Rob. No problem. The, 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 there's great information out there. We'll have to get, uh, for this, uh, for, for our podcast, we'll have to get Rob's email. So yeah, if clubs did have... He'd be a good man to get on some night. A power of information out there Rob has that, you know, that only Rob can relate to you. Because he, he, you know, he's been doing it so long with us, and it comes easy to him, you know. And uh, he works with the GDAs, and you know, the, making sure the reports are done every month. Because if the reports don't get into uh, Crow Park and the Patent Fund Affairs, these uh, GDAs don't get paid. So it's vital, you know. It's it's all right doing all the work, but reports are is very re responsible to have the reports done. Especially if there's money coming in, they want to know that you know. That the money they're spending is getting return. Uh, getting well, some returns, absolutely, right? you know, I, I just say to everybody that's doing, uh, you know, that gets these grants from the Department for Affairs to Crow Park, you know, do a little video of your training or whatever you're doing your your tournament because they love to see that. That that shows that you're doing your job, you know, and there, there's money well spent that you know it, it didn't go missing. You know, they, they they like value for money. And it's great, like they they, they 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 support us all the time. It's great, like what the Department of Foreign Affairs does for us. 
that's a good return on investment. You know, mm. that's it's listen, the USGA has come a long way since I've uh, first came out here in 2011. You know, the resources that are available has been, you know, night and day. You know, I think that's a good idea to maybe get Rob on one of these days to really mm. talk about that where clubs that, you know, maybe if there's like a American club who are just starting out and they don't really know where to start, he would be the man to kind of, you know, guide yes. them in the right direction. Well, you're just talking about the Red Wolves earlier on. We, as we call it, we just started that in the last number of years because we're getting all these new clubs. And it's no point just getting a new club and leaving them there because they don't understand. So we bring them on and we explain who we are, what we do. And, you know, Rob runs through, you know, the different things that is out there for them. There's grants out there, starting clubs and different stuff. So, you know, they have somebody to reach out to afterwards, you know, what because... They need they need more help than anybody because the first three years, like you know, they are sort of lost in it. Like, yeah, it's great to get out in the fields and play and everything, but the small stuff, if they, you know, to make sure they register properly, get their players registered. You know, there's funds there. There's different help for them, so they need somebody to reach out to. So yeah, vital. I think that's a good last question to maybe uh, maybe touch on. You know, if there is somebody who's listening and maybe are thinking about starting a club. You know, where do they start? Who do they reach out to? You know, is it yourself? Is it, you know, where where would they where would they go to? Uh, well, to start n- number that? one, they should be basically. We all said, you know, go through their division. You know, it's vital that they that, that the clubs work with their divisions. You know, and we are always there. The the, the USGA is always there for them. You know, it's vital that we, there's somebody there for them to reach out to. You know, they they don't know. It's like you know the Mex the guys from Mexico. They found us. We brought them on board and they were delighted because they thought we wouldn't be interested in them at all. Of course we are. But, you know, basically the, the best story ever, and there's one here from our local division here in, in the Northeast. We'll be back when I was chair in Boston. Uh, we're called the, the uh, we're called the New Hampshire Wolves today, but uh, they, they were a bunch of Marines and they, they came to us in uh, the meetings used to be in, in, in the, the boy in that time. And uh, they came to us looking for help, for some help on coaching and uh, information, how to play. They want to start a hurling club. I was saying, yeah, absolutely no problem. You know, we we have some, at, at that time now, there was no phones, much or apps or anything at the time. But basically, you said we'd give them as much help as we could. We'd send up some, uh, get them some coaches. And the man said, no, no, I don't need coaches. We can bring coaches. I was, I was, I still didn't get what he was on about, but basically, I know as we talked for a while, basically these guys were uh, in Iraq, and they said if we give us coaches, well, they'll have to come with us. But basically, they were looking for information how to play the game, so we did give them some videos and how they picked up on uh, about the game of hurling. They were on the way to Iraq, and the, the planes at that time used to stop off in Shannon and refuel, and uh, one day when they were. In Shannon, waiting when the plane, the, there was a North Island semi final on a Hurland semi final, and they said, Hey, we want to play this game. So, basically, what they did, they went back to Iraq, and the videos we gave them, they watched those videos, and anytime they got a break, they went out in the sand and started hurling. So, and they're still alive, to, they're oh, yeah. still going to the they're great club like. They were the Barley House, Barley House Wolves at that time, not the New Hampshire Wolves, but they, they, they've, they've come on great for you know, guys that's Marines and never seen any part of the game whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely no strangers to the wolves down, uh, down here. That many, uh, many good battles yeah, yeah, with them. Now. It's always, place. always a tough game against the wolves. Now, in fairness, yeah, they're they're great, great they've come yeah, a long way. Great club, yeah. 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 They've their own field up there now in uh, New Hampshire. They're doing, they're doing great work. But yeah, that's, yeah. Like, that's it around the country. Like, uh, there's some great stories out there from clubs. But uh, definitely, if you're starting a club, I would say you know try to, to get it done right. You know, get get kids coach proper. You know, because sometimes uh, they, that mistake is made, you know, you, you just put a coach out there and they don't know basically a lot of the ideas of the game. So, best, you know, there, there's good coaches out there and definitely do it proper. And the most important thing is go out and enjoy the game. It's a great game. And it's, the, the commandatory is the most important thing. Of, you know, there's great fun. There's a great party scene afterwards. You know, no matter where you are, it's not just here in the Northeast or in San Francisco or Chicago. Right across the country, th- these guys, once they meet one of their friends for life and you know, if they move, it's great, like, if they move to a, another city, you know, it's more than yourself, guys, when you moved out to Worcester, there's a club there, it's great. If there was no club there, you know, you wouldn't be coming back into Boston training or doing whatever. It's great, you know, that when you go to a different city, there's somebody there. So, 
you, we, you know, they, we've actually a couple of lads like that. Uh, two lads that actually joined. I think Brett, where did Brendan come from? Was it Twin City? Twin Cities, yeah. Twin City, and just moved to Worcester. It was like looked up the nearest club, and you know we have a couple of lads like that. It's I, I it's, you know, the GA community is such a a small community, you know, and it goes back to the old Irish, you know, we, we flock, you know, or as Tommy Tiernan says, we don't invest, we infest, uh, we infest. <laughs> <laughs> so, but no, it's, I listen, the GA community is a phenomenal, uh, phenomenal community to get involved with. Um, I know the junior clubs here uh, have done a really good, all the clubs have done to keep it going year round. Um, you know, you talked about those fall tournaments, you know, it's not just a summer tournament anymore. It's a, it's a fall, it's a spring, you know, it's a, it's a year round. I know it's tough up here with the weather, but mm. you know, we go down to uh, the boys, a couple of lads from our club were just in Vegas for a tournament. Uh, all, all around you see tournaments going on and it's phenomenal to see. Uh, but, uh, let's just talk to Mexico City about maybe doing a January mm. Cancun, Cancun oh, tournament. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. the guys, the guys down in the southeast, they start in January because look at it, it's too, uh, it's too warm during the summer for those guys to play. So they have a good few yeah. tournaments over already down the southeast. So if they're ever looking for, a, if they're ever looking for a team, the Worcester Fenians are always great for traveling. So <laughs> I think, uh, I think the USGA should divert all their funds to uh, getting getting these games going up in Cancun there, so we can get a trip going. Yes, we have. Uh, well, look, we the watch column has been coming um, the. Um, Cayman Islands has been coming into us over the last number of years, so we're trying to get those guys on board with us now. So we're pretty close for the Cayman to to join us also. A great so, bunch of lads too. Yeah, uh, I know we played them in one of the games over there, and just a great, uh, great community they have there. A bunch of Irish lads and English lads and Australian lads uh, that are over there in the Cayman. So, yeah, the more the more teams, the merrier. And maybe you know, as we get on, the more tournaments, the better. People look away. Look, people look forward to these. You know, I know once a year it's great to get away and stuff, but you know, it's the, again, it goes back to the camaraderie and the week. People like we remember Chicago. That's probably one of the best weekends of our lives. You know, and people will remember those weekends away. Yeah, we just want to thank anyone uh, who's listening out there. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, uh, leave a comment. Let us know what you think. Uh, we hope that this has given you a deeper, uh, deeper understanding of Bernie's role and the USGA in general. Uh, don't forget to tune in to our next episode and stay tuned to our social media for any updates. Thank you very much, guys, and I wish you a very happy St. Patrick's weekend and tomorrow and everybody across the, the county. I hope everybody enjoys themselves and good luck to everybody for 2023. And we'll see you all in Denver.